Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very senior and accomplished professional from Sydney, Australia, Mr. Graham Coven. Graham, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ash. Lovely to be with you. Uh, Graham is uh, the number one team care and resilience author and speaker. He is the founding director of RUOK. He's also the co-founder of VK365. He has earliest worked in senior leadership positions with Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and A.T. Kearney. In 2000, he went through a five-year episode of depression that his psychiatrist described as the worst he had ever treated. And Graham is an author, and all of you know I'm very partial to authors. He's an author of five books, including the internationally acclaimed Back from the Brink. So, Graham, what an amazing journey you have. And before I start asking you any questions about your book, tell me about your own amazing journey. Yeah, we all start off uh, with, a, I guess, a path in mind, but it often changes along the way. I, I started off in sales and marketing, and um, I was really passionate in that area. Work with uh, Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer. And then I was invited to become a recruiter. So mm -hmm. I worked in recruitment for about um, probably about 10 years all up, um, specialising, first of all, in the healthcare sector and, um, and then just more broadly working in executive search across a whole role, role of a um, bunch of roles and responsibilities mm -hmm. in companies. And then uh, in about 2000, when there was a big correction in the market, I was focusing on uh, e-commerce recruitment mm -hmm. and um, that area got totally destroyed during the whole uh, tech wreck of 2000 and I went through a really really bad episode of depression it lasted for five years I didn't work at all during that time uh, over that time I lost um, my job my marriage broke down and I had to go and live with my parents and uh, and then you know, I, I was at that stage, I was just convinced that I would never recover, never, you know, go forward again. But it was a gradual walking out of there. Mm -hmm. Writing my first book, Back from the Brink, was a really important part of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I got asked to, you know, speak at various um, country towns and workplaces. And, and then I was also involved in 2009 in starting... A movement in Australia called Are You OK? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very successful movement now. Um, you know, it's got um, unprompted recognition of about 83%. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's about looking out for those we're concerned about and asking them, Are you OK? And uh, if, they, if they're not, encouraging them to seek help or trying to help in mm -hmm. some way. So that's a, a quick overview. Amazing, amazing. So let's start talking about your book, Back from the Brink. And you've just uh, told me it was played a significant role in bringing you out of the challenge you faced. But uh, Graham, one of the things I've noticed and about mental health is that it's often stigmatized and misunderstood. How does Back from the Brink aim to change that? Well, it's one of the main reasons for doing it, Ash, because I, I reached out to well-known people and everyday people who'd been through it and through the power of storytelling it just really conveyed the message that well if this could happen to someone who is a, a premier of one of Australia's largest states or an Olympic gold medalist or a, a, one of Australia's most famous artists and poets it can happen to anyone mm -hmm. and I really noticed that when people would you know respond and write into me they often mention the name of someone that really struck them, someone they could really relate to. And uh, storytelling can play a huge role in changing uh, minds, attitudes, beliefs, behaviours, uh, if, if they're done well and authentically. Hmm. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, I'm assuming a lot of this book, Back from the Brink, is your own story. But tell me... Uh, about the role your own personal experiences with mental health played in shaping this book and give me one or two examples. I think a big thing was that, you know, going through it um, and understanding it intimately, I wanted to be from the perspective of not an expert, but someone mm -hmm. with experience. 
And so, yeah, I shared my story. Um, but more than that, I shared other people's stories as well. And mm-hmm. I also surveyed over um, 4,000 4, people mm-hmm. who've been through depression and anxiety to find out what worked best in their recovery. Mm-hmm. And uh, that really helped to provide a bit of a roadmap for people. And it, it came what became known as the I Care Framework. And mm-hmm. so the I stands for how we identify someone who's depressed or if we're depressed ourselves. The C is for compassion and how we ask, are you okay with empathy? The A is for access experts, mm-hmm. helping people to find expert help to assist them. Mm-hmm. R is for revitalizing work and work is very good for our recovery if we can do some form of work, be it voluntary or light duties. Mm. It just gives a bit of a sense of purpose and E is for exercise. And so with that uh, framework, it's sort of grown into another business that I co-founded called We Care 365. Mm. And that's where we make um, you know simple e-learning courses which show managers how to prevent mental health issues and, uh, and build psychological safety. Mm. Interesting. And uh, for a lot of the readers who will read your book, and I'm asking all our viewers and listeners to go and check out Mr. Graham Cohen's book, Back from the Brink, I'll go and check it myself. How can readers apply your advice about resilience and bouncing back from adversity in their own lives? Yeah, well, the IQ framework I talked about before was more helping someone who's really, really struggling. Mm-hmm. But in terms of resilience and staying well, I talk about three important outcomes for me to pursue. Mm-hmm. And the first of that is what I call vitality. Mm-hmm. And that's our physical well-being that comes from exercise, good rest, good food, intimacy, which is our emotional well-being. These are the people around us, the special people around us in our work life, but also our home life that uh, provide us support and we support them. Mm. They can act like our scaffolding when things go wrong, having those strong and supportive relationships, particularly for men. Men are very poor at um, you know, nurturing conversations where you're vulnerable or, or saying you're not in great shape. So that's the intimacy. And the, and the third part is prosperity. And that's our contribution energy and resilience that comes from Mm -hmm. for some people it's the work they do you know i know ash you're on a mission here to to share messages around the world Mm -hmm. and that's a wonderful contribution energy that you get from that Mm -hmm. for others be you know their paid work for others it can be uh, volunteering for a school or a sports team or a charity you believe in but all those things vitality intimacy and prosperity Mm -hmm. things we need to do each day and so my message for people is to Act like a VIP each mm. day. Mm. And that means putting a little bit into our vitality glass, a little bit into our intimacy glass, a little bit in our prosperity glass each day. And uh, that, that's a bit of an immunization from um, tough times and setbacks. You, mm. you do that regularly. Mm. Great response. Thank you. Uh, you also talk of a multi, you know, range of mental health issues. Are there any particular issues you feel are especially misunderstood or under-discussed in our world? Yeah, I think one of the big things is uh, around stigma. There's been a lot of work in Australia in particular in trying to reduce stigma. And are you okay? It's done a lot to contribute to that. But there still is stigma in the workplace and uh, people feel reluctant to share their story, mm-hmm. if, whether it's a personal story or knowing someone else. Mm-hmm. So... We truly believe that managers the key to creating mentally healthy and safe teams. Mm. They're the ones that set the example. They're the ones that um, you know provide the supportive environment. They're the ones that provide the feedback and encouragement. But also by leading by example, they encourage other people in the same team to do that as well. Mm. And uh, one thing that I did, Ash, about, it's about two months ago now, I shared on LinkedIn mm-hmm. Just really a, a statement that said the best thing we can do to boost employee mental health is to mm. give them good managers. Mm. And it went off. It had 2.7 million views, likes, yeah. shares mm. around the world. And it also confirms what uh, Gallup research has shown as well, that 
a manager contributes 70% towards the engagement and the well-being of the team. Mm. The manager is the key to having mentally healthy workplaces. Very interesting. And uh, is there any one message that you would want to relay to someone who's currently facing a mental health struggle? I would encourage them to tell someone they trust. Mm -hmm. you know, it could be a friend, it could be a work colleague. And just explain what's happening, that, um, you know, I'm not on my normal game. I, I'm not as sharp as I normally am. My memory is not as good. Um, and uh, I need to get some assistance. So sharing mm. that I think is really important. Mm. If, if they haven't, um, if they haven't uh, got someone close to them, well, there's, there's helplines as well. You know, there's various helplines in different countries mm -hmm. where you can ring and get support, advice and guidance. So help seeking would be the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing would know that um, this does pass. <laughs> you know, when I was in my really, really long depression, my psychiatrist always said, this will pass. And mm -hmm. He said it so many times, and and it, and it did happen. Even though when I was at my worst, I knew mm. that it um, it wouldn't happen. And you know, if you can find a sense of purpose through that experience, it it adds a lot to your life. And uh, I now lead a, a really good and meaningful life, which ironically wouldn't have happened if I hadn't mm. gone through that really dark time. Mm. Mm. So one more question relating to depression, and then I talk move to resilience. Uh, given all the work that you have done, what are some of the signs that parents or co-workers should be watching out for if there is a behavior change? And it, it, it is basically that, Ash, it is changes. So it could be changes in behavior. Mm -hmm. Someone might not be, you know, mixing socially anymore. They might be retreating. They might be socially isolating. So change mm -hmm. in behavior is a big one. Changes in mood, you know, someone could be uh, much quieter than normal or much angrier than normal. Mm. Uh, that's a big thing. And it can also be changes in circumstances. Mm. Uh, if they suddenly lost their job or gone through a divorce or had a death of a loved one, those sort of changes really should prompt us to look out for those that we're concerned about and mm. Just make an observation about the change that you've seen. You know, I notice you don't coming to you know Saturday morning coffee with us. Is everything okay? Are you okay? Mm. And then listen without judgment. Ask questions because the more people speak, the more they feel understood, and the greater the ch the uh, chance you can mm. then influence them to um, do the right thing. Mm. Very interesting. Let's now talk a little bit about resilience. And you've done a lot of work in this area as well. Um, tell me, how do you define resilience? I just think it's uh, it can, it, it, there's a proactive element. <laughs> so you can do stuff to be more insulated from setbacks and disappoint, mm -hmm. disappointments. But also when you do have a setback, there's things you can do to boost your mood. Mm -hmm. And... I think that ultimately uh, resilience is consciously doing things that help your mood, enhance your mood. Mm. Because uh, Harvard Business Review tells us that if we're in a positive mood, we're 31% more productive, 37% mm. more influential, and 300% more creative. Mm -hmm. and, and the three things that I mentioned before about doing the right thing, it's, it's mm. doing stuff for your physical health, exercise, good rest, uh, your emotional health, strong and supportive relationships, mm -hmm. and prosperity, which is our contribution health, doing things mm -hmm. that assist others. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you found, Ash, with the uh, almost 2,000 uh, stories you've shared, that uh, mm -hmm. you get a bit of a boost out of that as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And what role, uh, in your opinion, uh, does resilience play when it comes to mental health? They're both, they're very, very closely connected. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I said, if you strive to do things that keep you resilient, it mm -hmm. does help prevent um, uh, episodes of depression it, it, or it makes it much harder to come on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you have rituals in your day, like exercise or meditation, it's good for your resilience, but it also helps prevent mm -hmm. depression occurring. Mm -hmm. uh, those things we can 
choose to do. And it's not always easy. We get busy and we put it on the back burner. But uh, making time for those things is non-negotiable, in my view. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Someone who's been through the really tough time, you know, I'm, I'm very now very disciplined to doing the right things that keep Correct. me in good place. Correct. And and how would you say really, you know, resilience is related to other concepts like grit, courage, or tenacity? I think there's a lot of overlap, Ash. There really is. Um, you know, if you read Grit, which is a great book, or you know, books about courage, <clears throat> they're often about doing things a little bit outside your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. You know, when you feel like giving up or feel like not trying, mm-hmm. just going a little bit further and and trying those things. Um, you know, I think there's and you need courage when you don't feel like it to get out that door and go for a walk. Mm. <laughs> just getting out the door when you're not feeling great Correct. can be a lot of work. And so mm. just getting out to, you know, the front street and just doing a little bit can really mm. just put you on the right path to mm. uh, b- bouncing back. Mm. And what would you say are some common misconceptions about resilience? I think uh, a lot of people feel that you're either resilient or not resilient. Mm -hmm. Um, And it is very much something that can be developed. It can Mm -hmm. be strengthened. It can be grown. The other thing that I think is a misunderstanding is that it's just that you have to think better. You know, Mm -hmm. you have to reimagine things or reposition things or reframe things to bounce back. Mm -hmm. And that can be a component but that is much, much easier to do if you are physically healthy and well and and feel supported to do that. Mm. So it's not just, um, you know, reframing. It's also about doing things physically and mentally which uh, keep you in a positive mood. Mm. And uh, how do you think we can use resilience to overcome failures and setbacks? You know, if you talk with any successful entrepreneur, and I know you're an entrepreneur yourself, Ash, and I've spoken to many others, it's not all one big win, is it? <laughs> Correct, it's not. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yes. you know and, and in fact, in entrepreneurs, you have to keep on evolving and keep on changing. Mm. And, uh, and resilience helps us to do that. You know, not being too devastated if it doesn't work out exactly as you hoped. That, uh, you know, because as I said, when we're in a positive mood, we are more productive, influential, and creative. And they're all essential qualities Mm. to be successful in work, but also life. Mm. Fascinating. So I have time for two more questions for you. My next question is that based on your own work and in your opinion, are there any cultural differences in how resilience is perceived or cultivated? Very much so. And um, I, I just know through talking to lots of people, but there's some places in Asia and, mm. and India is one of those where there is a higher stigma. Mm. There's also that applies in Japan, Correct. Korea. Mm. Um, and there is something cultural there. Now, there is progress being made, but um, in all the, all the discussions I've had from people from those countries, mm. there definitely is a higher... Uh, stigma involved and and sadly I'm not sure about the suicide rate in India but in places like Japan and Korea mm. they have one of the, and China they have one of the highest rates of suicide in the world and I, mm. I really believe that's because people are ashamed to say they're not coping mm. and they're ashamed to seek help mm. yeah you're probably right in a way also you know in in India or for South Asia or a lot of Asia for boys it is always you know, you got to be a boy, behave like a man, behave like that, you know, and there's that also that perceived macho-ness or resilience, which is expected. So you're, you're so right about it. Uh, and my last question to you, and this is for the thousands of people who will listen to our conversation, based on your own amazing journey, your understanding of depression, your work on the area of resilience, what would you say are three lessons you would want a lot of our young viewers and listeners to take away? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting thing to think about. And one of the big things I talk about is be caring and 
that means for self-care. Yeah. It means for caring for those around us. Mm -hmm. And it also means for caring for those that are really struggling. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And if we're helpful and we're constructive and we, we strive to add value with those around us, mm -hmm. it keeps us relevant, but it also helps those around us. And so it's a win-win. And the third thing, and um, this also applies very much in, in business, is, you know, persist, learn and grow. Um, you know, often... We're, we're very close to success. We just uh, persist a bit harder, learn a bit more, and try at one more new thing. Mm, fascinating. And on that note, and your wonderful lessons, be caring, be helpful, and persist. Thank you so much, uh, Graham, for speaking to me about your journey. Thank you for sharing with me so many different things about depression. Thank you for speaking to me about your book, Back from the Brink. And thank you also for speaking to me on so many different aspects of resilience. Thank you again and good luck to you. My pleasure, Ash. It's been wonderful to join you today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.